The Lunder Conservation Center is located on the third mezzanine and fourth floors of this building and features floor-to-ceiling glass walls that allow the public to view the conservation work of our conservators here. These spaces that are usually left behind the scenes at other museums are part of our program to, to advocate for the profession. The center strives to fulfill its mission for raising public awareness about the field of art conservation by supporting programs such as this one today that highlight the work of conservators. This program underscores the value of partnership between curators and conservators, promotes original research as part of an innovative exhibition, and showcases the wealth of information generated when multiple institutions collaborate. It grew out of questions that developed during the research for the exhibition Inventing Marcel Duchamp, the dynamics of portraiture, and importantly, is an opportunity to test archival research against the physical evidence of the objects themselves. I was asked to remind you that the catalog for this is available up in the bookstore upstairs. You will be hearing about the context for this research from our first panelists and the curators of this exhibition, Dr. James W. McManus, Professor Emeritus of Art History at the California State University, Chico, and Dr. Ann Collins Goodyear, Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings at the National Portrait Gallery. Dr. Goodyear will be followed by our presenter, Scott Gerson, Assistant Paper Conservator at MoMA in New York, and Scott Homoka, Associate Conservator of Works of Art on Paper at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Our other panelists will follow Adrian Sidholter, Assistant Research Curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Shelley Langdale, Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And Michael Taylor, the Muriel and Philip Berman Curator of Modern Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. At the end, we would like to encourage discussion and questions, but we request that you use the microphones in the house so as to capture your questions. We are recording this program. Thank you again for joining us today. At this point, I would like to turn the podium over to Dr. McManus. Hope we can get the image up here. <laughs> Marcel Duchamp arrived in New York from Paris in June of 1915. Around September of that year, Jean Coty also settled in the city and soon joined Duchamp sharing a studio in the uh, Lincoln Arcade building, uh, which they shared until September of 1916 when Coty returned to Paris. And at that, around that same time, Marcel Duchamp moved to 33 West 67th Street. It was in this studio where Duchamp began assembling his large glass, working on glass panels, attaching wire and thin sheets of lead foil, techniques that he had pioneered earlier in Paris in the fabrication of nine malic moles, also shown on the screen. Croty, who trained as a painter at the Academy Julian, seems to have undergone a significant transformation during this period one he later referred to as his second birth. Uh, breaking from a reliance on traditional painting materials and techniques, he began, represent, he began experimenting with glass, lead, wire, and other materials in works done in late 1915-16, notably the portrait de Marcel Duchamp sur Messieurs and Clown illustrated on the screen. The title, Portrait de Marcel Duchamp sur Messieurs, suggests that Croty was attentive to more than Duchamp's making processes. The phrase sur Messieurs translates as made to measure, inferring a possible relationship to the ter Taylor's terminology, itself referenced in Duchamp's three standard stoppages done a few years earlier. The use of the phrase sur Messieurs offers other possible readings as well. One might be a pun on the fact that Duchamp arrived in New York a quote unquote ready-made hero. Another could be a reference to Duchamp's newly coined term, the ready-made. 
Beginning in 1913, while still in Paris, Duchamp had begun collecting objects to which he would assign new identities, new functions. These objects, the bicycle wheel and the bottle rack, are precursors to the concept of the ready-made that seems to have more fully taken shape after his arrival in New York in mid-1915, where soon after that he produced pulled at four pins seen on the left and in advance of a broken arm shown on the right. The accounts of events inform us that Croty was a confederate uh, participating in the acquisition of that famous snow shovel and its ceremonial march back to their shared studio. Could Duchamp have begun using the term ready-made as a part of his vocabulary by this time? We know that by January 15, 1916, in a letter to his sister Suzanne, he introduced her to the term ready-made explaining its function in his thinking and requested that she sign the bottle rack, making it, after the fact, a ready-made executed at a distance. The materials and processes used by Croti, lead sheet and shaped lead wire, matched those being used by Duchamp at that time. Bill Camfield has speculated that Croty molded the piece of lead foil to Duchamp's forehead. If so, I would suggest that Croty provides a witty allusion to the Malik molds, conflating his image of the artist with those of the key ingredients in the bachelor machine of the large glass. Using the Peter Julie photograph as a model, I matched the line of Duchamp's lower face and nose with that of the Stieglitz uh, uh, profile photograph seen on the left. <clears throat> they match well enough, suggesting the possibility that Croti could have traced the line, itself a form of measurement for his profile of Duchamp's face. Assembling the parts, Croti gave greatest importance to Duchamp's brow, both its completeness and the modification of its position in relation to the profile of the lower part of the, of the face. In other words, bringing it forward, suggesting that Croti, thought, or Croti sought to emphasize Duchamp's cerebral nature. The sculpture was exhibited twice, first at the Montrose Gallery in April of 1916, and then that September, Croti departed for Paris, leaving his portrait of Duchamp behind. Its next and apparently last public appearance was the first exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists that opened at New York's uh, Grand Central Palace in April of 1917, some months after Croti had already departed. The address given on the registration form was that of 33 West 67th Street, where both Duchamp and Ehrensburg were living at that time. However, the, the lender's form does not identify who loaned the work itself. From this point, the history of the sculpture becomes murky. Legend has it that the sculpture was purchased by the Ehrensburg and became part of their collection. However, an investigation of the Ehrensburg papers and photographs reveal no evidence supporting this claim. The next that we hear of this, about this piece, uh, when Duchamp informed Croty, now his brother-in-law, in May of 19, uh, in May 21st of 1921, uh, that he had acquired two cliché of the tit from the photograph uh, for, from the photographer Peter Julie. It is likely that Duchamp carried the cliché with him, delivering them to Croti when he arrived in Paris that June. In 1949, responding to an inquiry from Catherine Dreyer, who was seeking to add the piece to the collection of, for the Société Anonym, Croti said that it had either been lost or destroyed. However, in 1958, shortly after Croti's death, René Barreau, writing in Le Promissor magazine, made an unsubstantiated claim that he had seen the piece in Croti's studio a few days after his death. And again, 
1959 in Robert Lebel's monograph, Sir Marcel Duchamp, the piece was described as destroyed. The fate of the sculpture remains unknown. We only know it through the Julie photograph and the Croti drawings that will be discussed here today. Whoops, did I lose something? There, we want that one. Okay. It may be that it, like the 1937 McMorris portrait of Duchamp on display in our galleries, is out there in hiding, simply waiting for discovery. Thank you. tight. <laughs> As Jim has indicated in his remarks, Croti's provocative 1915 sculpture of Duchamp today survives in a photograph formerly attributed to Man Ray, now known to be by Peter Julie. In this respect, the piece is not unlike another work in our exhibition, Baroness Elsa von Freytag Loringhoven's lost whimsical construction, Portrait of Marcel Duchamp, captured by Charles Scheeler. It also recalls Duchamp's infamous fountain, documented by Alfred Stieglitz in 1917. However, Croti's Portrait sur mesure stands out among other examples of sculptural ephemera of the period due to the existence of two related drawings. Now housed at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, these objects are at the center of our discussion today. The more finished quality of the drawing in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, coupled with the inscription at the bottom right of MoMA's drawings, a little hard perhaps to pick up, but right down here, which specifies, and I translate from the French, first study for the portrait made to measure of Marcel Duchamp, indicates that the PMA drawing was the second of the two works to be created. Both pieces are inscribed 1915, a date recently called into question by a combination of documentary and physical evidence. The reconsideration of that dating grew out of an invaluable interinstitutional collaboration combining the resources of MoMA, the PMA, and the Smithsonian. At this stage in the proceedings, I want to acquaint you with the circumstances that led us to reconsider a date that had seemed self-evident. In the summer of 2006, as MoMA, as MoMA hosted a loan show devoted to Dada, research for inventing Marcel Duchamp was progressing in earnest. Adrian, Adrian Sudhalter and Scott Gerson, together with other colleagues at MoMA were at that time carefully studying a number of works owned by the museum for a scholarly catalog on Dada art in its collection. When Jim and I paid a visit to MoMA to study the museum's drawing, Scott, Adrian, and their colleague Kathy Curry invited us with characteristic generosity to join them in MoMA's paper lab. 
By good fortune, Leanne Daphner, MoMA's paper conservator, or rather photographs conservator, happened to be repairing a vintage photograph of the sculpture. Putting the photograph side by side with the drawing, we immediately realized that Croti's drawing did not anticipate the construction of the sculpture, as the inscription seemed to suggest, but rather was a copy of the photograph, thus clearly postdating the making of the sculpture and challenging the traditional interpretation of the 1915 inscription as pertaining to the date of the drawing's manufacture. Another surprise was in store for us when we examined the verso of MoMA's, of MoMA's photograph. There we found a stamp from the studio of Peter Julie, causing us to rethink the traditional association of this image with Man Ray. The discovery of Peter Julie's connection to MoMA's photograph opened up a new line of inquiry regarding the photograph and the related drawings, one that was helped immensely by the presence of the Julie archives at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Although Julie's negatives for this photograph of, of Croti's sculpture unfortunately no longer survive, the Julie archives file provided the impetus to consult the Croti papers at the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art, where Duchamp's correspondence with his sister Suzanne and, her, and his brother-in-law Jean Croti is housed. In the Croti papers, I was intrigued to discover a non-vintage copy print, a non-vintage copy print of Julie's photograph of Croti's sculpture of Duchamp, which testing now dates to the early 1950s. But even more intriguing was the emergence of a small photograph, a small snapshot, which we now know dates to the 1950s, documenting the two drawings side by side on an easel in Croti's studio. The unexpected snapshot provoked further questions about the dating of the drawings, seeming to raise the possibility that Croti had only recently completed them before photographing them. This line of thought was further stimulated by another item in the Croti papers, an August 17, 1952 letter written by Duchamp to his sister Suzanne and her husband Croti while Duchamp worked with Sidney Janis on the organization of an exhibition devoted to Dada. In preparation for the exhibition, Duchamp requested the loan of Croti's 1916 assemblage, The Clown, a work consisting, as Jim has told us, of lead wire, glass eyes, and colored paper on glass. Quote, if you think of anything else from the period, tell me, close quotes, Duchamp added, and directed that the clown, and presumably anything else, be sent to the, road, to the Rose Fried Gallery, where Duchamp had recently organized the exhibition, Duchamp Brothers and Sister. Duchamp even suggested in his missive that Fried herself could courier Croti's work by collecting it during an upcoming European trip. The inscription of Rose Fried's name on the verso of, PMA's draw, of the PMA's drawing and the presence of a documentary photograph of the drawing by John Schiff in the Rose Fried papers at the Archives of American Art, clearly made for the gallery, indicate that, in addition to the clown, Croti also provided the more polished of his two drawings to Fried. Indeed, the appearance of Croti's drawing at the Rose Fried gallery is the first historical record of the existence of either drawing. The work was purchased from the, from the gallery by the attorney and collector Joseph Solomon at some time during the 1950s. Before sending the work abroad, Croti made this photograph of it with its mate on an easel in his studio, documenting the two drawings. Throughout the process of weighing this circumstantial evidence and reviewing it, Scott, Adrian, Michael, Shelley, Jim, and I have been in close consultation. Our discussions have been invaluable in rethinking the relationship of these drawings to the sculpture, the photograph, and one another. In late February, when the two drawings, together with a vintage photograph of the sculpture, came to the NPG for our exhibition, 
We had, the, we had a chance to search for further physical evidence with which to shape our understanding of these works. And I'll now invite um, Scott Homolka and Scott Gerson to share with you our findings in the paper lab. So good morning. <clears throat> I'm Scott Gerson, and um, so this is the, I guess, the, a pair of Scots up here. And so um, I'm a conservator at the Museum of Modern Art, and I um, wanted to begin um, our talk with just sort of a lineup of the two drawings and the photo um, from MoMA, just to sort of stress the relationship between the three images. Um, and so you'll notice that the only place that the drawings really deviate substantially from the photo is in the base, where um, Croti has uh, developed the base more in the drawings and slightly changed the perspective. And then that the only place that the drawings really substantially deviate from each other is also is in this line that um, is rendered to the, represent the support wire. Um, it's slightly longer in the MoMA drawing. Um, a detail of the sculpture's proper left eye. And so this detail in the middle is showing the reflection of the studio window in Peter Julie's uh, studio in the glass eye. And if you look at the corresponding details, it appears on the left in the MoMA drawing and then on the right in the PMA drawing. I think it really shows the level to which Croti was working from the Julie studio photograph. Another detail uh, of the three works um, <clears throat> showing the two drawings dated 1915 and then the photograph dated 1917. Uh, there is a second vintage print um, that exists in a private collection of the Julie photo and that is dated uh, 1915. So all this is really to say what Jim and Anne have already outlined for you, which is that the dating of these materials um, is, requires a little bit of suspicion. I think it's pretty clear that we can operate under the assumption that the artist was working directly from the photograph of the sculpture. And we know that the sculpture was begun sometime in the last months of 1915, that it was exhibited first in April 1916, so that gives us some idea that it was probably uh, photographed sometime in early 1916 um, and um, published for the first time in this article in Vanity Fair in June 1916. Um, as Anne mentioned, very little early historic documentation of the drawings exists. Um, the earliest photograph is, is this one, this snapshot from the Archives of American Art, which shows the both drawings on an easel, uh, presumably in Croti's studio. As Anne mentioned, the photographic process suggests that it was taken sometime in the 1950s. And uh, just to remind that the provenance and the exhibition history of both drawings um, begins in the 1950s. And so begging the question, perhaps it was made then. So the initial questions that we were addressing in our technical examination were, what is the relationship between the drawings and the sculpture and the photographs? What is the relationship between the drawings? When were the drawings made? And if a relationship exists between the drawings, can they be similarly dated? So the materials that we had at our disposal for the technical examination were the MoMA drawing, the uh, Philadelphia drawing, the black and white snapshot from the Archives of American Art, um, the vintage Julie photo, which actually wasn't um, here in Washington, but which we had examined at MoMA quite extensively, and um, the uh, conditions that we examined these works were under not uh, were only um, under normal illumination, transmitted light, raking light. 
ultraviolet light examination. Uh, we did a microscopic examination with a stereo binocular microscope, and then we commissioned a fiber analysis of um, both drawings. So the initial research um, for uh, this project, as Anne mentioned, 